Hello, and thank you for joining us. We're really excited today to be here with Dr. Erin Pritchard, who is a lecturer in disability studies at Liverpool Hope University. She's also a core member of the Center for Cultural Disability Studies, and her work focuses on the social and spatial experiences of people with dwarfism. Drawing on this research, she has written about her own experiences as a female academic with dwarfism in her most recent paper, Female Researcher Safety, The Problem of Recruiting Participants at Conventions for People with Dwarfism, um, which focuses on the issues of, of researcher safety and understanding of disability and sexuality. So um, in honesty, we'll be referring to this piece, this paper a great deal today because it has so many important implications and um, many ways in which fieldwork can be problematic and many of those insights. First, I want to thank you for being here with us, Dr. Pritchard. Richard, for lending your knowledge and experience to this conversation. Um, it's wonderful to have you. Um, maybe you can start just by telling us a little bit about your work or, or this field work that you reference in the piece. Um, of course, um, we're going to share the, this piece as a link below for people to access it themselves, but maybe in your own words, you can share a little bit about, uh, about it with us. Okay, uh, thank you. Firstly, it was um, something that I never envisaged writing because I was scared to. Um, because it, it's drawn from my PhD research and I was, wasn't was interested in any of the research um, formalities. I was just interested in gathering participants to talk about experiences of what it's like to have dwarfism and some of the, you know, social and spatial experiences from name calling to not being able to interact with facilities because they're too high. However, um, when I was recruiting participants, I mostly um, try to recruit via associations for people with dwarfism. So every, most countries will have an association for people with dwarfism and they'll have these conventions where loads of people with dwarfism meet. Um, the biggest is Little People of America, which is obviously in the US. Um, mine was uh, based in the UK and basically when I went there, it was partly a safe space because it was the only space that I've ever really been to where um, people aren't gonna, you know, abuse you because you're a dwarf. However, it was important to look at the intersection, you know, intersections of identities that I wasn't just a, a dwarf, I was a woman with dwarfism. And as I saw myself, I was a doctoral student there trying to recruit participants. But of course it's important to build a rapport. Mm -hmm. So I went there as this researcher, but some people have a different take on it. There's some men, not all, who go there as a way to find a possible date that's okay and this one guy he asked me out and I refused but it you know he sort of didn't take no for an answer and so I was like looking at this safety you know I'd done like an ethics form like everybody else the university mm -hmm. you know really ensured about my safety but it was mostly safety of you know going to somebody else's house to interview or traveling across the UK by train or car whatever nobody looked at possible female researcher safety um and so when i experienced that i told one of my close friends um who is a researcher down at sussex and she was like i'm putting this book together write about it and i thought no they'll that you know when i put it in my phd i reported it to the association got very little feedback from them and um, they were like basically oh this doesn't happen at our place they were very um, defensive of themselves and then when I had to write it in my PhD I got this horrible email back off them threatening me with legal action because I dared to speak out and they were like you've got no evidence of this and I'm like but it's you know it's basically my word against his but he was his girlfriend was on the committee so of course my views weren't going to be taken seriously and I wasn't like trying to bad mouth the association. I was just trying to say, this is happening. You should be aware of it. You should be aware of the safety of your, you know, your members. Um, and it's not a reflection on you as an association. It's just like me too is showing it happens anywhere. Right. But they weren't interested in that. It was just more, you know, we're going to threaten you with legal action. So I stayed silent for a long time until my friend was like, no, you should write about this and the publishers will have your back, you know? So basically, I just agreed to take out the name of the association mm -hmm. and thought, no. And so it was a strength to write about it. Right. Wow. I knew I, when I read the piece, I was so angry for you about um, this, this um, all, first of all, everything that happened. But mm -hmm. um, in this notion that um, this idea of, oh, that doesn't happen here. This is a safe space. And if you say something about it, people will accuse you of robbing 
um, others to access the space because now you're painting it as dangerous and so many people rely on the space and how difficult it is to um, be the one like you become the problem even though you're the victim it sounds like that's a lot of what you also experience um, within a community which you um, is a place that you're a member of and you talk a lot about how difficult that is to be a member of this community that now it almost sounds like they kind of went against you and then you you know it's a very very nuanced place to be um, and, you know, in the piece, you mentioned how the Me Too movement has been somewhat exclusive and not all encompassing of, you know, plural experiences like these, um, and how it's kind of lacking current research in, in encompassing, you know, disabled women's experiences and larger understandings of harassment and gendered violence in general. So, um, in your opinion, do you think this puts great pressure on survivors to voice publicly or document your experience, their experiences? I know you were kind of sort of hushed a bit and and so it feels like there's greater pressure to speak out and those implications i mean what do you feel like um what is your sort of insights or experiences or thoughts about the pressure to um first of all if you stay silent then you kind of feel that oh, it's happening and you don't have a space but if you speak out there's great pressure too yeah um definitely like i think the me too movement was a great thing because it showed that it was so common in very different areas whether it's hollywood or in my case a, a charity um you know and it, it's all over the place and i think people have been silenced for so long and now we have this place to speak out but you're still kind of pressured that you should speak out in case it happens to someone else blah 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 i didn't really feel pressured to speak out i was encouraged i was more pressured to stay silent um, I had one guy from this association saying I'd scare off all male dwarfs um, as if like, oh yeah, because I want to date them all, you know, I'm not bothered. Um, he even said to me, oh, there would have been a chance of me dating you, but I won't now. Well, I'm not hurt. Um, you know, I, and I think it's, it's really dependent on the person, but I think now because so many women are coming out, it's not necessarily pressure, but encourages more to speak out, you know? Um, I never I felt pressured. I, I did it because this is my release valve. This is my way of coping with what happened by saying, you know what, I'm not staying silent. Then that's that power reversal that, you know, like you say, the victim is blamed. And this is, you know, it, with sexual assault or harassment or anything like that, it always seems to be the victim's fault from what mm -hmm. she wears to where she went. I'm not saying it doesn't happen to men either, but it's mostly female. And it's always your fault and you are being nasty to accuse men or whatever, but it's like, well, if they just behave themselves, this wouldn't be a problem, you know? Right. Um, but yeah, I felt, no, I'm going to sort of speak out about it. And I found now that speaking out about it, more women sort of tell you. Yeah. And then I've been finding out more and more stories. And that's why I sort of, my friend, uh, my colleague, Della Edwards and I want to put together a book to say, right tell us your stories you i'm not forcing you but tell us right. because we think this should be out there because for too long women have just got to just stay silent like good girls you know what i mean right yeah absolutely um i think if i can quote your piece you mentioned you that you kept thinking you know nobody will want to participate in a research project when the researcher has accused somebody of sexual assault and especially in like a close-knit community um and so that difficulty as well of now you have to continue to do your research in this community. Um, did you, so I, I, it sounds like it's true. I mean, you mentioned in the piece how there's this sort of one weekend where people want to make connections, some, some maybe amorous, which is fine, um, obviously with two willing participants. Um, but this is, I'm assuming this is not the first time this has ever happened. And so did you hear, did you get any um, people that spoke specifically within this community that, that yes, this is a problem that's sort of been overlooked? Um, I asked because what, what I, we've seen a lot of is that when people maybe go, you know, for field work from whatever context, they're very afraid that if they speak about the experience, it's going to cast a negative view on that community. You know, they're very aware of how stereotypes work or what people might think. And so they want to really, um, which is what keeps people silent. It's sort of like this double edged sword. And so I'm worrying, or I'm wondering about just in general, like what sort of feedback or people who've kind of come out in within that community and spoken about similar experiences. We know that it's individual it's not spaces but as well just what's sort of been the um, support maybe or wave of support have you gotten within within the community about it I've had some good support surprisingly um because I 
started recruiting via social media and so I'm part of quite a few groups for people with dwarfism on social media and mm -hmm. the only backlash I got was on that one association site mm -hmm. um however when I shared it on things like uh, little people women um you know uh, little people only these people were really supportive even including some men because like I said it wasn't all men and some men said if this is a problem then it needs sorting out because it also reflects badly on us now those were the sensible ones mm -hmm. and then a lot of women said I've had this problem I've had this trouble um, and so in the book chapter that I wrote, and I think in this article, I have a couple of quotes from some women who I um, asked, you know, I got their consent to include because it was like, yeah, it, it's quite common. And I think it started the ball rolling. And since then, you know, there's been like a random comment I'll post on Facebook on a social media site saying, I had this, I keep getting emails or keep getting private messages of these male dwarfs and I'm just not interested you know um so i think it's quite well known in our community but people have always got to stay silent about it or it's just not getting out there and that's what i want it to do because and like you say there is that worry of the stereotype because mostly disabled people have been deemed asexual that we don't you know participate in that kind of thing whereas we're not um so i think that impacts a lot of your you know potential of getting a partner I mean, I've just been in a Twitter debate um, recently because, you know, in uh, Ricky Gervais's show, he, he has a character who says there's pedo Ian because we call him pedo Ian because he slept with a dwarf because automatically sleeping with a dwarf is childlike. So there's all these kind of repercussions and stereotypes. But what I don't want to do is create this stereotype that we're hypersexual, that m male, male dwarfs are, you know, dirty old men, pervs, because they're not. It's just like, any other walk of life you are going to get good and bad people mm -hmm. and there's a lot of male dwarfs that are very respectful very good it's just you get them you know mm -hmm. like anywhere else um yeah. but it's something that needs to be talked about because if you keep it silent it'll just get worse and worse mm -hmm. yeah that was exactly going to be my next question which was this is part of a larger history of the erasure of um, disabled individuals' experiences with uh, sexual violence, harassment. Um, I'm asking, I, I kind of um, leading it to you because you are a professor of disability studies, um, but this is not just, um, this is not a new problem. This is what something we've seen, just a complete lack of, um, you know, experience being cited in literature about uh, gender, all, all sorts of things. Um, and it seems like it's just yet another form of um, inequality that exists in field work as well. Um, and maybe even, the, I mean, speaking about the boundaries of, or, or the barriers of field work for individuals with disabilities, which of course is a very plural thing, um, but um, there seems to be this idea um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, and uh, you, you sort of alluded to it in some of your writing, that there, that people will be safer if they work in their own community. Um, this mm -hmm. is also a problematic idea, of course. I mean, oftentimes, um, you know, people, I mean, even myself, I was told, oh, on your next research, why don't you exclusively work with women? Um, and it kind of felt like, oh, okay, I kind of want to work wherever I want to work, you know. Um, is there pressure for individuals with disabilities or maybe individuals with dwarfism to work within their own community? I mean, you mentioned that there was a lack of, of people with lived experiences, and that it's very good to have that connection. But is there pressure put on people that they have to, that they have to do work in that community? Um. I, I don't think so. I wouldn't say there was pressure. Um, I just ended up in this because I was a geographer mm -hmm. before I, you know, got into my PhD. I mean, well, my PhD is in human geography. It was just something because I had this interest and a lot of disability research comes from that interest. If you're a disabled person and you do disability studies, it's usually based on your own sort of positionality, your own experiences, and then you broaden that to include others. Mm -hmm. um, I never really felt pressured, but I suppose it sort of made sense. And you, you do feel that you're going to be safer. I felt going to an association for people with dwarfism, I was going to be safe. Um, you know, you just, did, I never contemplated that this would happen. Right. You know, um, it was more that sort of ethics and practice where it's not something you, you think, oh, I, you know, I, I think I would have felt really silly if I put on my ethics form. Um, risk of sexual assault I would have pro probably felt very vain or something you know it's just bizarre even now with my students I'm 
in one mind to tell them you've got to be careful about this, but then they're probably going to think, you know, that I'm the wacky lecturer or something, but it's just coming out so much now. Yeah. So, yeah, I just thought I would be safer because there'd be sort of people that would have the same understanding. We all, you know, we understand the prejudices we experience in society, mm -hmm. but obviously it flipped it on its head and I never took into account that um, some people use that place as just a pure dating space, you know? Right. So if right. that's something I'd be aware of in the future and would warn mm -hmm. any other researcher with dwarfism to mm -hmm. be the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, just as you mentioned about stereotypes, it, we are conf sometimes confused because we have this image of like what an, a harasser looks like and it's so far removed from the reality at times so we don't come to expect it, which is just, um, there's a lot of confusion about um, in the aftermath. Actually, if I can quote from you exactly, you say, um, England focuses on how the researcher can shape the research process, recognizing the possible exploitation of the participants. What is neglected is that some participants can also use the opportunity of partaking in research in order to exploit the researcher. Um, and this is such an important point because we know um, participating in research can be like the perfect excuse for interlocutors to kind of achieve proximity to the research as what was your experience. And they may feign interest in the work but have like ulterior motives taking you out or whatever. Um, and it can be very confusing for the research because as you noted, maybe going to that dance is a very important angle of the social components of this gathering. And um, if you negate the advance, um, it either escalates or the perpetrator tries harder or they walk away entirely and so the researcher loses that participant, right? So it's like a very rare thing that the individual accepts a rejected advance and still in stride continues and says, yes, I'll still participate in the research. So it's like, I'm thinking like how it's almost an impossible position to be in as, as a researcher, because in maybe another experience, you know, if you were there on your own accord, maybe you could leave or walk away, but what do you do as a researcher in those spaces? Yeah, um, I mean, like when I went there, it was, I saw myself as just a doctoral researcher, mm -hmm. but it was how that participant then viewed me was a, just a woman with dwarfism. Yeah. And so, yeah, you're trying to negotiate this, this, these identities and say, and build a rapport with them so that they feel more comfortable around you so that you can interview them without them feeling, oh, it's a researcher. If I say something silly, I'm going to look stupid. Mm -hmm. um, whereas this was like, oh yeah, I'll take part in your research. And then you get to know this person more and you're like, oh, hang on, there's an ulterior motive here. Yeah. Um, and just like, no, it's fine. Um, you know, move on sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really difficult because, you know, you could, some people are expected to go to their house and stuff to interview. That's a normal thing for researchers. Yeah. Now with people with dwarfism, it seemed fine. I mean, you, like you say, you have this perception of who's sort of dodgy um and like it could be researchers like if you're doing research in a prison ex-cons i'm not trying to stereotype here because they can be perfectly all right but dwarfs they should have been safe um and then like i did speak to that other phd researcher who said yeah he had this ulterior motive and i just had to stop the interview and i remember recruiting one guy interviewed him finished the interview and then he kept texting me and texting me and i'm like what's going on here i said sorry i've been at um uh, you know an interview all day in, traveling to Manchester and he was like who's the interview with and I go can't tell you it's confidential you know and he goes was it with another man and I was like no actually but that's none of your concern I said you know I, you were just a, a participant and you don't it really shocked me to find out that he thought that it was more that you know I mean I'd interviewed 22 women I'm not uh, you know uh, bisexual or anything so I don't know where he was getting this idea from that I was a researcher and my ulterior motive was to date him or something but it was purely professional and even just that recruitment he felt this other guy that he felt that he could just you know get along um you know try and date me but luckily that stopped before he could even I did the interview I tried to think what that interview would have been like with him you know, I would not have been safe. I would have had to travel down to wherever he lived and it would have put me in a much more dangerous situation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But you are very well kind of showcasing how 
vulnerable. You have to give your number. They know your name. They know where you go to school. They know about, you know, your connect, you know, and we do this in order, of course, to have contact, but also usually re um, participants want to know about the research. And you feel, you know, they're telling me everything about their life. I, they can ask questions about me too, but it's, it's um, a very vulnerable position to be in. And there is this thing where they feel maybe jealous of your time. And it does show that there's this ulterior motive. Um, and it's, it is uncomfortable. And, and also I was thinking that we really don't know how many people walk away from their research because this becomes mm -hmm. too much. We, we don't have, you know, we don't know what we don't know. How many people say, you know, okay, this, I, I, if this means doing field work, I don't want to do it and they leave and abandon. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about the support that's needed. Did you feel that you had support from your committee? Did you feel in that moment that, um, you know, that you um, could could say, hey, this isn't comfortable for me? Um, or is there anything maybe that you wish would, or, you know, that would have helped if, if it was there, maybe you wish would have been in place for you to feel safer or just in general to be more comfortable in your experience? Um, I felt I had absolutely no support off the association, thought they were useless. Um, but I did get good support from the, my two supervisors, um, who were both professors. So when at that university, I had good support. Um, they were like, okay, let's look at this. Um, you know, maybe just interview women now. And yeah, I was so glad about that. I mean, I didn't tell them for ages because I felt so, I couldn't process it myself. And in the end, I told my supervisor what happened and they were, so they, we, they had this meeting and it was like, right, just interview women. Um, don't go back to any of those associations if you don't, because I knew there was um, another convention coming along and I thought, I've got to go there. I've got to try and recruit. But I was getting so anxious and upset because I thought I don't want to go there again. So they said, don't go there, but email the association, tell them what's happened, let them know what's happened. Um, Cause you know, they, we all thought they should be aware of this and do something about it. But then I just went and interviewed women um, who I recruited via social media, um, different groups on Facebook and that was it. Um, but then when it blew up and the association was like, Oh, you know, because I named them, they were threatening legal action. But my supervisors, again, you know, they laughed at half of the things they said. They said it's ridiculous. So then, but they said, just take the name out. You know, it'll just be easier. But then the best support that I've had was off my uh, friend down at Sussex, but also from a professor at Liverpool Hope University, because when I, he's my research mentor. And when I sent him the book chapter to look over, because he always looks over for, you know, typos, errors, everything that I do wrong. He says, Erin, you've got to turn this into an article. You've got to. And so then I was like, I'm being believed here. Someone's believing me, not just, a, you know, my close friend, but, you know, this mentor. And then um, he arranged, uh, like he does every two years, he arranged a conference for disability, um, the CCDS conference. And he says, I want you to be on the plenary session with your paper. So it really gave me this platform. And that's when I felt most supported, like really supported by him. And then, of course, with other colleagues who have now come out and talked about this and stuff. But yeah, so in academia, I felt supported, but I just don't think there's enough in academia to um, normalize it in a sense and say, look, this could happen to a female researcher or even a male researcher. Um, so I think they need the support networks there. Like, you know, with field work initiative, that's a good area and that's a good place to start. Why can't we bring that into university, update the ethics and say there is, there are risks, whether you're a student, a researcher, whatever of sexual misconduct and it's how we can minimize those chances you know, so what we can do there, and that would be the best support, I think, for all researchers. Right, yeah. Um, just hearing about everything that it just, you know, took as far as the backlash you got, I was just found myself thinking, not just as a researcher, but as a person, like what you have to go through, it just in the aftermath of a sexual assault is hard enough, but then to have to carry forward this work and be in this sort of situation where you, you know, deserve to get your degree. Um, and also that you have been robbed of the ability to feel safe in a space where you should otherwise be able to participate in. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that takes a huge personal toll. And, you know, you mentioned even just anxiety or thinking, you know, how will I do an interview again and feel comfortable? And so there's a, yeah, a really huge personal toll on top of the fact that now you have 
to make use of your data writings and do your PhD, like that's already a journey in its own. So it's, it's really a huge thing there. As much more support is needed. Um, and speaking of that, um, what, do, what do you feel that best practices uh, maybe for allies looks like considering support for fieldwork? Um, and I know this is kind of a difficult question because we know fieldwork is very plural, gender is very plural, disability is very plural. Um, it's a kind of a vast sea of possible contexts. But more generally, I'm curious your thoughts on um, how to best practices of support um, for allies of, um, of how to make fieldwork more equitable. Yeah, I think because now we have to move like um, fieldwork, of course, was very male dominated. Uh, very non-disabled person dominated and very positivist research where your participants weren't really included. So now we have to try and make it, how do we make that place safe for various identities? Because you're expecting me to build a rapport with people, but you're not thinking of my safety in that rapport. So I just think we need networks. We need something within academia that specializes in that sort of thing. So we've got disability support, we've got, you know, well-being centers, student support. We need something that's a sort of researcher support led thing that provides that support, not just signs off an ethics form and says, yeah, you're free to go now and interview people, but provides that support that they, there's somewhere that, that they can go and say, this happened. You know, it might not just be sexual misconduct, it might be various other things, but they can say, this happened to me where do I go from here, what support, and then to have some specialist in that area to support that person, that makes sense. Um, it makes a lot of sense as needing, the need for more specialized considerations in how fieldwork mm -hmm. is done, instead of, oh, you just go out there and make it on your own. And you mentioned especially how spaces, they can be gendered, they can be racialized, they can be staturized, you know, and how we don't, this is really not something that, the burden is more on the researcher to make it, make it work for them or just deal with it or get over it or all the things that we know have been said. Um, but speaking about work to be done or work being done, we want to talk about this, um, this chapter proposal a call that you have out for sexual misconduct in everyday academic spaces, experience and ethical dilemmas, um, which is accepting papers until January. So there's a good amount of time to get that um, going for our listeners. But maybe you can talk a little bit about that, that work that's upcoming. Okay, so um, my colleague and I, Della Edwards, she's in the School of Social Sciences. Um, we came together because she noticed my paper and she goes, I'm trying to write something similar. So we had a few meetings and so we decided we were hearing too many stories so we decided to put together an edited book um and so we are looking for anyone academics um you know students postgraduate students that kind of thing who have experienced sexual misconduct in higher education it can be either field work or teaching whatever and to propose and to write about that so that we can add it to our um, book um, there is a long deadline but because we had so many other things going um, and just to share that story in a safe space in, in a book you know we will go by the ethical procedures to sort of not name institutions if you you know not name certain people anything like that because we understand that having to write about that can be difficult for some people you might be weary that you might drop someone in it your institution might react badly to it that kind of thing but we want people to share these stories because like what we say with the Me Too mo movement, it's exposing sexual harassment in a lot of places. What about higher education? You know, I mean, I've read stories, horrible stories about students who have been raped and they've had the courage to come forward about it. But then, you know, the judge or whatever said, oh, you know, we can't um, discipline the, the man too much because he's got a good uh, future ahead of him. It's like, what about the woman's future? You know, it's been ruined basically. Um, so we want people to share their stories so that we can bring it to the forefront and say academia is, is not, you know, um, exempt from uh, sexual misconduct, but how do we deal with it? So we want to show these are the ethical dilemmas, these are some of the experiences, how do we respond to them? So, yeah, I mean, we are taking um, chapter contributions, we're looking at abstracts, so if anybody wants to send us one, um, send to my email address or to Stella Edwards, um, we will get back to you, especially after Christmas. Um, but yeah, it'd be brilliant. We really hope to have like a lot of diverse contributions from, you know, an international perspective, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so anyone listening and interested, we're going to share that. It'll be linked underneath or have it on our, 
you know, it'll be um, easy to find that call. Um, and it is so incredibly important to um, have, I think it's also, it can be, not for everybody, but it can be somewhat therapeutic to and have a space in which this is, um, they're able to talk about their experience. Sometimes it takes time. Like I think you wrote your piece a little after your experiences, after your work was, was finished. Um, and sometimes it takes time to feel okay about doing so, but it, it can be incredibly cathartic or in general, I think it can be, um, for some people, it, it's, it's a necessary outlet in order to share their experience, lend it to a larger um, movement of understanding that this happens and that this is a big problem. And that's a very plural problem in its context and in everything. Um, so yeah, this is, this is really important. Um, and so again, we're gonna have that linked. Um, are there any final thoughts? Maybe we could um, hand it over to you to share any, any thoughts, lingering ideas um, that you feel are important to mention. Um, I just think now it's time for like when, wherever you're going to, you know, the gatekeepers you contact, the places you go, that people are aware that these things can happen, that researchers aren't just, you know, androids, um, the real people sort of thing. And I know that sounds daft to say, but, you know, it, we can experience all those things as researchers. Um, so it's about trying to say, what can we all do to work together and make safe spaces? And that, you know, places need to be, take more responsibility for the actions that can happen like that. Um, but I would say just for people to be open about it because it, I mean, I know it's difficult. I know it's hard for people to talk about it, but that's where we can make it more common and not as taboo and say these things happen. And it, whether it's disabled people or just women, anything, there's so many intersecting identities and that, yeah, it does happen to disabled people, but the best thing is to be supportive in that. And I think too many times there's just you know, it's about time that we supported the victim that most people do not lie about this. This is the problem. Most people think, oh, you know, she, she must have regretted something. It's not the case. Mm -hmm. You know, I felt for a long time I was being, I was going to be disbelieved. I didn't want to tell anyone when I told my friend, she believed me, but again, it was a friend. But then it's through time that you realize people do believe you and people are there to support you. Mm -hmm. so the more of that we have the better but it's not a pity thing it's not like I don't want to be sort of this victim or anything I just want this is just normal as far as I'm concerned mm -hmm. and so it's about normalizing it but not accepting it if you know what I mean right yeah um it's it's such a common sentiment of worry that we know victims have and survivors have that they won't be believed um even though um it is at the same time odd because um, I find it, I, I would find it uh, like for myself and my own experiences odd to, um, it's hard enough to say that it happened. Why would I say, you know, it's hard enough to like talk about it and speak that this happened to me. The idea that it would be made up is just such a silly feeling. And we also know that the, the uh, um, percentage of false reports on sexual violence are quite low. Um, but society has another idea. Society has another view for some reason. Um, we often get people thinking that there's going to be money involved or they're going to get a lawsuit. And even in the rare cases where lawsuits are brought about, they're always in general to create some sort of a, um, you know, some putting something in place to protect people in the future. And these are things that are very costly and they take a long time. And there's no, uh, th there's such ridiculous beliefs that society holds also about where these things happen. So that's such a, such a very important point. I we thank you for raising it. Um, and thank you as well for, for your illuminating insights, lending your experience to this conversation and the way, you know, do we want to disrupt all the barriers that exist? And there are many. Um, and we greatly appreciate um, also everyone who's watching supporting field stories. We we'll want you to look into that call. Also look um, into Dr. Pritchett's work on this. Um, and we'll be at it again next week, of course, with another field story kind of pushing forward conversations on fieldwork inequality to spur larger change in society, academia, and, and in knowledge production. So unless there's any other final thoughts, Dr. Pritchard, I want to give you one last chance. To... Um, I just think that this is a great thing that you're doing, the work initiative, like looking at all sorts of things. Like when my uh, Della shared it with me, I thought, yes, this needs to be here. So fantastic work. 
thank you so much. You make me blush a bit here. So we'll, <laughs> we'll end it here. <laughs> but thank you very much and as well for, for your writing. Your piece is really um, so important about, you know, one of the larger things is people, um, these views that, oh, yeah, that's what happens if you go to these spaces. And we really want to show people this is a human problem. This is not belong to any one culture, any one country, any one language. This is a problem that happens across time and space. And um, it's been long overdue to have these conversations. So thank you so much for, for being with us. And, and sharing all these insights. And we maybe we can connect folks to you, I know for the call, but others who, are you open to have um, people write to you if they have a similar experience or um, maybe. people can um, yeah. email you and, and connect with you about this because I think it feels like you are, this is something you're also passionate about and you're building work in the future towards. So um, wonderful, thanks again. And we're signing off, that's us. Um, have a great um, rest of your day and we're gonna, um, hopefully connect we with um, everybody's going to connect on this call that's coming so cheers